Open your Bibles to Job, everybody. We are in part two of our lighthearted, uh, lightweight series called The Problem of Evil and the Goodness of God. I say that jokingly. Obviously, this is a pretty heavy topic. And last week, we started the series by looking at kind of the whole of the storyline of Scripture, big picture, kind of zoomed out. And we began by considering what, you know, the problem of evil, which has been debated by philosophers and theologians throughout the centuries, where many, and especially atheists, would contend, well, God must not exist because if he did, then how do we account for all the evil of the world, whether that's moral evil, the things humans do to each other, or natural evil, the category they use that term for the category of natural disasters and diseases and all the things that plague us in this world and have forever. So there's this question of how, how can God be both all good and all powerful when evil exists? And last week, as I said, we looked at a big picture and we were pointed to the goodness of God, the kindness of God. And this week, we're going to zoom in. We're going to look at the story of Job. So it's one thing to think about these things conceptually or philosophically. It's quite another thing when we encounter evil in our lives, when something happens, something unexpected, those hardships of life, the things that hit us out of nowhere, and it's like everything stops, and we find ourselves, like Job, sitting in the ashes, wondering, God, what? how could you even be there? Things that seem unfair, things that seem cruel that happen in our lives, we could feel like we're being mistreated from above. Unexpected diagnosis, diagnosis with a disease of some kind tragic accident, a loss, a relational betrayal, someone you thought was loyal to you, and it's revealed that they have not been loyal to you. I mean, something that cuts to the root of your heart, to the depths of your being, and just flattens you. Those types of moments, which many of you have had in your lives, others of you maybe not yet, but that are an inescapable part of life. It is our destiny at some point to be, to be sitting in the ashes with, with Job, to be reduced to nothing. That's, that's one thing we have in common with him. And so we're going to look at his story this morning, and we're going to consider how when God allowed evil to flood into Job's life, really in the course of a few hours one evening, when God allowed that to happen, he had good purposes for it. And in the end, was revealing to Job what Job needed the most, which was a clearer view of his creator. A deeper understanding of that saving relationship between God and a creature. And we're going to learn from that. We're going to learn from that. We're going to consider this, this reality of evil in this world, how that manifests evil responses from within us, and how then God tends to us graciously what he reveals about himself, and how he ministers his healing to us, ultimately through Christ. So we're in Job, and it's going to be kind of a fast-paced jet tour through the book of Job this morning, but I, I believe we can do it. We can make it through. So let me just begin by reminding you, and we'll read a few verses here, but just to set up, who, who is this character of Job? Some of you were in the Job Sunday School class. This will be familiar to you. Others of you have studied this book. It'll be familiar to you. If you haven't or you haven't recently, this will be a good way to kind of get you up to speed. Let's just read in the beginning here, Job 1, verses 1 through 3, and be reminded of who this man was and what life was like for him before things went wrong. It says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the East. 
Did you hear that? He was the greatest of all the men in the East. You would say of Job, if you knew him, that guy has everything. Wife, family, ten kids, all these animals. It's a lot of animals, right? All signs in those days of great wealth. And along with that, the understanding was, if someone had that kind of wealth, they were blessed by God. They were enjoying a particular kind of, remarkable kind of favor from above. That was the understanding of someone like Job. He had it really, really good. He had servants. I mean, you can only imagine, he's administrating all this property, livestock, all this wealth, all this abundance, and he has ten healthy children. And you know how the story goes. Jump down to verse 13, and in between, I'll just say it in summary form here, in between it lets us in on what's happening in heaven where Satan is desiring permission to basically test Job. And then we jump down to verse 13 and we start to see what, what happened there. It says, Now on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And can you imagine? I mean, in the course of maybe minutes, seems like it could have been minutes, and one after another, these messengers come, they tell them, Hey, Job, everything's going really badly right now. I mean, your worst nightmare is unfolding right now. It's hard to even calculate what that would have felt like from an emotional perspective, the shock of that. Many of you, maybe all of you have, have lived long enough, although I see some young kids in here. Many of you, maybe most of you, have lived long enough to where you've had that type of moment. Maybe not on that scale, but something has happened. You felt like... Like something opened up and evil just came right into your life and you didn't know what to do with it. And you were stunned. That's where Job is at this point. And then we see, and this is what I remember being highlighted throughout my years of Bible study way back in the beginning when I first cracked open this book and Listen to preachers and things. You, you see that Job has this response. This is what's often highlighted. He has this apparently righteous response. Look at verse 20. It says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God, it says in verse 22. I mean, here is a, is a clear response, a worshipful response. We're amazed as we read it. Think, wow, his devotion to God. In fact, in the beginning, you remember in the beginning of the book, he was an upright man. He's a man who feared God and turned away from evil. And we see, so we see evidence of that in, in this initial response. However, so we humans tend to judge according to appearances, or we make sort of quick snap judgments, and we see we see something, we think well, that's all there is. Well, there's it turns out there's a whole lot more going on here. And as this unfolds, and as time goes by, we see more unfolding. And we see Job beginning to crack. And as he cracks, we see beneath the surface of what's really there inside of him, deep down. So there's response number one, which is this worshipful, 
submissive, reverent, even truthful response. It says God gave, God took away. But then we see this other response. Look at chapter 2. Remember, after all these things, Satan requested permission to touch Job's body. To this point, his body hasn't been touched. Satan requests permission to touch his body, and he does that. So it says in verse 7, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, smote Job with sore boils and from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a potsherd, Job did, to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, and, and notice this similar to his response that we saw earlier, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not adversity? In all this, notice what it says, Job did not sin with his lips. So, so in this initial response, I mean, it even says explicitly here, Job did not sin with his lips. So we see an apparently righteous man with the best conceivable response to a horrible, tragic occurrence. But as I said, there's more it cracks, and we start to see what's beneath the surface. So jump ahead to chapter 3, just a few verses later. Afterwards, in verse 1, it says, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. It would be easy to go quickly by that, but I want you to notice something. Remember earlier we read in verse 10 of chapter 2, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Well, here it basically says, and in the Hebrew you can see the root is the same. Here it basically says, Job opened his lips. He opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. So now at this point, Job begins to express what's really going on inside of him, what he's really thinking, what he's really feeling. I noticed something. I've been studying this book for a while. We, we went through it in Sunday school. I even preached sermons from portions of this book here recently, but I, I haven't even noticed this until just this past week. But turn to chapter 7 for a moment. I want to show you a little glimpse of Job's heart. You remember Job begins to talk, and he's talking about his struggle with what's happened. And he even describes his decision to begin talking. In chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, Job is bemoaning all the things that have taken place and what this says to him about his terrible plight in life. And he says, when a cloud vanishes, chapter 7, verse 9, when a cloud vanishes, it's gone. So he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. He will not return again to his house, nor will his place know him anymore. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. So yes, initially Job didn't say anything other than those truthful things we saw there in chapter 1 and a little later in chapter 2. But eventually, he begins to open up and speak of the bitterness that was within him, where his heart was really at. In fact, in chapter 3, if you go back there, when it begins, it says, Afterward, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. I mean, I look to see why. You know, it's interesting that it says he opened his mouth and said. Most of the time in the Old Testament, when someone is speaking, it just says, And he said, and he, she said, and so-and-so said. It says he opened his mouth. Like, it explicitly says it. It's pointing out here, yeah, he was quiet for a time, but then he wasn't quiet. And as Jesus said, from the heart, the mouth speaks, right? So he begins to reveal what's really going on in his heart. And there's something learned here because you know what is happening in Job's life? Here's what's happening. He is wrestling with the problem of evil. He is wrestling with God himself. Not just some concept, but he is wrestling with God himself as a result of what's happened in his life. So continue reading that section of chapter 3. Job said in verse 2, Let the day perish on which I was to be born, and the night which said a boy is conceived. May that day be darkness. Let not God above care for it, nor light shine on it. Let darkness and black gloom claim it. Let a cloud settle on it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. 
Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful shout enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day who are prepared to rouse Leviathan. In other words, it, it would have been better for me never to have been born. It's kind of like with the problem of evil. Well, God either must be evil or not all powerful because evil exists. And if he's all powerful, he can stop it. He could have stopped it. And if he was going to not, and if he's going to allow this to happen in my life, I wish he never would have let me be born in the first place. And whose plan was it for Job to be born? Whose plan was it for you or for me to be born? How much control did we have over that? <laughs> Zero. So he's wrestling with God and even explicitly he contends with God. I want to show you a few other places that show that while on the surface it appeared and people believed Job was righteous. And even in a sense, God says, hey, compared to other people, he's the greatest. I mean, outwardly speaking, in terms of what you see, yeah, he's the best of the best. But inwardly, what we see is, and this is really important, he's really no better than anyone else in that he too, with all his blessing, and all that he had, all his wealth and his great family, he too, really at the bottom, was in it for himself, just like everybody else. And depending on what your background is, and how much detail you, you've studied or not studied this book, this may be a bit confounding, but I want to show you evidence of this reality. And there's, and there's two particular chapters that we're going to look at to show evidence of that, that to me have been, I mean, life-changing. And, and I'm really indebted. Don, Don was the first to observe some of these things and teach through in Sunday school. And it, it really hit me hard and was helpful to me, exposing of my true condition. I can, these things resonate with me. I can identify with them and, and, and also minister to me the gospel of God's grace. And I hope the same can happen for you, all in the context of this problem of evil and yet the goodness of God. So Job 29, turn to Job 29. And you will probably be surprised by what you see here of this upright man. Job 29. This Job was expressing, and again, it's understandable. I don't want to minimize what he went to this point. We don't know how long, we don't know how much time has gone by, but think about it. I mean, day after day, night after night, he is suffering. I do not want to minimize that. This is a brutal situation. Can't even imagine the pain, the depths of it, the loss. I can't even imagine. So please don't, don't dehumanize Job. He's a real person. And he is being acquainted with his frailty. And it is extremely difficult. But notice what comes up in terms of his view of himself and the way he viewed life before all this happened, chapter 29, and we'll just make some observations along the way. We could spend a long time, but we'll just kind of in summary form, he'll make some observations along the way. Chapter 29, verse 1, and Job again took up his discourse and said, so he's speaking, he says, Oh, that I were as in months gone by, as in the days when God watched over me, which is a way of saying, hey, I remember the good old days when God was actually watching over me, meaning when God was my friend back then. Before he turned on me. You, you follow? And that's what he's getting at. Then he goes, When his lamp shone over my head, and by his light I walked through darkness, as I was in the prime of my days, when the friendship of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, and my children were around me, when my steps were bathed in butter, which is a weird thing to say, but just means life is going well for him. <laughs> Made more sense back then in their culture than to us today. But things are good. And the rock poured out for me streams of oil. When I went out to the gate of the city, when I took my seat in the square, the young men saw me and hid themselves, and the old men arose and stood. What does that speak to? R-E-S-P-E-C-T, right? That's what he had. You see? The princes stopped talking and put their hands on their mouths. They covered their mouths. Oh, here's Job. Let's just listen to what this wise man has to say. 
And the voice of the nobles was hushed, and their tongue stuck to their palate. For when the ear heard, it called me blessed. And when the eye saw, it gave witness of me. Because I delivered the poor who cried for help, and the orphan who had no helper. The blessing of the one ready to perish came upon me, and I made the widow's heart sing for joy. I even made widows sing for joy. He's probably thinking when they compared me to their late husband, they're like, wow, this guy's amazing. I, I don't know exactly what he's thinking, but he thinks he's pretty special here. And there could be you know, some more sincerity there and obviously some fruitfulness to that. But look what he says next. I put on, this is so important, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. You see, he says, I, I clothed myself with righteousness. I treated people well. I was a leader. I was esteemed. I was eyes to the blind, feet to the lame, father to the needy, investigated the case which I did not know. I mean, I was helping everybody. Everybody who came to me, I'm helping them, he says. I broke the jaws of the wicked, snatched the prey from his teeth. I rescued people. Then I thought, I shall die in my nest, and I shall multiply my days as the sand. My root is spread out to the waters, and dew lies all night on my branch. My glory is ever new with me, and my bow, my, my bow is renewed in my hand. To me they listened and waited and kept silent for my counsel. After my words they did not speak again and my speech dropped on them. They waited for me as for the rain and opened their mouth as for the spring rain. I smiled on them when they did not believe and the light of my face they did not cast down. I chose a way for them and sat as chief and dwelt as a king among the troops as one who comforted the mourners. Can you get the picture here? Things were going real well. He's at the top. He's at the prime. And everyone knows it. And then, look at verse 1 of chapter 30. But now, those younger than I mock me, whose fathers I disdained to put with the dogs of my flock. In other words, I, I was like a father to them. I was so much better, superior when compared with their fathers, and they esteemed me, and now those young people, they mock me. I'm a laughing stock. All that I had, I've lost to include not just all the stuff, but the, re the respect. And aren't the hardest losses in our lives those that not only rob us of a relationship, but also on some level rob us of respect, a sense of identity. I think about so often I'm talking with people who've lost their job for one reason or another. And, and, and not only does that invite financial insecurity into their lives, but also this question regarding their very identity. Who, who am I even anymore? And you can struggle at such a deep level with that sort of thing. And here is Job saying, what, what's left? I'm laughing stock. I'm small, reduced to nothing. I was a king. And now I'm this pauper. And by the way, was he feeling good about that demotion? No. No, in his humanness, and like the rest of us, we would be feeling the same way. It's, hey, what is, what is the deal, God? Really? You're going to reduce me to this? I mean, I'm your guy. clothed myself with righteousness. I did right by the people around me, all the people around me, in his view, in Job's view. Okay, a little bit more, chapter 31. It's more evidence of the same thing, but I think it brings up more and more what how Job viewed himself and his righteousness, his, I would say, even self-righteousness. Chapter 31, verse 1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? Job had all the same moral categories that we tend to fixate on. Hey, I, I even treated young ladies appropriately. He goes on, What is the portion of God from above, or the heritage of the Almighty from on high? Is it not calamity to the unjust and disaster to those who work in iniquity? Those that deserve it, he's saying. Does he not see my ways and number all my steps? Isn't he aware of how I've lived my life? 
If I have walked with falsehood and my foot has hastened after deceit, let him weigh me with accurate scales and let God know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way or my heart followed my eyes or if any spot has stuck to my hands, let me sow and another eat and let my crops be uprooted. In other words, if I deserve this, then let it be, but I don't deserve this. If my heart has been enticed by a woman or I have lurked at my neighbor's doorway, may my wife grind for another and let others kneel down over her. In other words, just go ahead and take my wife and give her to some other man then. He's, again, implicitly what he's saying here is, I never did these things. I don't deserve this kind of outcome. Jump down to verse 13. If I have despised the claim of my male or female slaves when they filed a complaint against me, what then could I do when God arises and when he calls me to account? What will I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make him? And the same one fashion us in the womb. I had this equal view of, of people. And If I have kept the poor from their desire or have caused the eye of the widow to fail or have eaten my morsel alone and the orphan has, has not shared. In other words, if I didn't share with the poor, then fine. But I did share with the poor. And he goes on with more details along those same lines. Verse 24, he talks about his material wealth. If I have put confidence in my gold and called fine gold my trust, if I have gloated because of my wealth and because my hand had secured so much, or if I looked at the sun when it shone or the moon going in splendor and my heart became secretly enticed and my hand threw a kiss from my mouth, that too would have been iniquity calling for judgment for. I would have denied God above, but his point being, I haven't done these things. I didn't gloat over my material wealth. I didn't do that. Verse 30, no, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a person's life in a curse. In other words, one of his enemies took care of aliens and foreigners. Notice chapter 32, verse 1. And this is Job's friends. Then these three men ceased answering Job because he was, what? You see it? He was righteous in his own eyes. I mean, do you see Job in his self-righteousness? In one sense, we could say, if you looked at his life, you would say, yeah, he, he had a really good track record. But deep down, we understand what true righteousness is, the kind of selflessness, and love and humility we see, for example, in blazing glory in the person of Jesus. No, Job, like us, was still in it for himself. And he treasured what he had. And that's normal. That's human. And God is just exposing that. And he used the invasion of evil in Job's life to reveal that. And then one last section here. And you, you know the story, but... One final section toward the end, when, when Job has poured out his heart, it poured out the bitterness of his soul, as he talked about earlier, then we come to the end, and, and this is where God begins to speak, having patiently listened to Job and heard everything Job said. Now God is going to interject, and notice what happens, and this is how all the story comes together, and this is where this prepares us to consider the gospel and how God's kindness to us can be seen in the person and work of Christ, especially in the context of this quote-unquote problem of evil. Look at chapter 40, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken, I will not answer even twice, and I will add nothing more. In between, God had said, Hey, Job, where were you when I created the world? And gives all these amazing, intricate details of the world and the craftsmanship and the masterful creativity of God. He gave him all of that, and then Job is kind of reduced to his place as a small creature. And, and God says here, Job, Hey, are you going to find fault with me? And Job has now been humbled, and he says, look, I, I've said a lot, and now I'm, I'm covering my mouth. 
Remember earlier, he was delighting in the fact that when he spoke, the young man and the older man, they closed their mouths, they listened to him. I mean, he was in, in his mind, kind of in that place of God, and now he's in his rightful place. He's saying, I'm a creature, he's the creator, he's wise, I'm not. I close my mouth, I'm all ears, God. What do you have to say to me? Do you see that? You see, something's changed. God's doing something in Job's life. We're going to see what it is in just a second, but do you see the change? Do you see the shift here? Going through that grueling process, and however many many days and sleepless nights and he even says in places he had all these nightmares and horrible uh, waking up in the morning to these horrible traumatic dreams he had had and I mean he just went through a bunch of that types those types of experiences and God now has him kind of in his place and he's listening in verse 6 says the Lord answered Job out of the storm and said now gird up your loins like a man I will ask you and you instruct me will you really annul my judgment will you condemn me that you may be justified Job in clinging to your own righteousness which is another thing he explicitly says elsewhere earlier in the in the book when clinging to your own righteousness here's what you're saying Job you're saying God you're not you're unrighteous and I'm righteous I see the way this really is my judgment is accurate God yours isn't and God's here saying is that really the case Job is that really true? And this, by the way, can sound like harsh, but is God being harsh or is he up to something good in Job's life that Job desperately needs that Job didn't even realize he desperately needed? Just like we don't even realize what we desperately need. And I would say he was up to something good. And here's where we see it in the text. Right after that, in verse 9, God says, Do you have an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with eminence and dignity and clothe yourself with honor and majesty. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and make him low. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them in the dust together. Bind them in the hidden place. Then I will confess to you that your own right hand can save you. Job, if you can humble the proud... If you're capable of doing that, then I will confess, I will agree with you that your own right hand can save you. Implication being, Job could not do that, nor could Job save himself. Implication being, not just those people out there who were proud that needed to be humbled. But remember King Job, called himself king. God says, Job, can you rescue yourself from your biggest problem, which is your own inflated view of your own importance, your own independence, your own preoccupation with all that you have for your own honor, for your own glory. Job, who can save you from that? And God is saying, Job, only I can save you from that. And I am not... I'm not claiming, because it would be really arrogant on my part to claim that I could solve this problem of evil, this deep, extremely complicated philosophical question. Certainly can't do so in a few messages. There's aspects of this that I, I'm sure I'll wrestle with until I die. And depending on what God allows to happen in my life, I, I will wrestle to one degree or another to a, you know maybe more or less, but I mean, we will all. And I'm not claiming to be able to resolve all of this. But I think some things we can know, God's revealed to us. What we need to know, we can know. And one of the things God is up to in allowing evil to take place around us in this world is He is up to this. He is rescuing us from the evil within us. You know, the real poison in your soul is preoccupation with yourself, blinders to the Creator and His kindness and goodness to you and this unhealthy attachment or it can be healthy for sure with you know family members and he lost children of course that's healthy but there are aspects of it that still that fallenness within us like wraps itself around even the best things in life and just taints them and permeates them with the poison of self-centeredness and sin and rebellion and ego and everything of that harms us and harms and exploits others as a result of that. Only God can save us from that. And what he's up to is he uses the evil of this world to expose that evil within us to show us our need of salvation. And now we go to Jesus. The greater Job. 
the truly righteous one. Who lived, though the creator of all things, lived in this world in the body of a creature and suffered in all of the worst ways. And in all that suffering, never rebelled against his father, did he? Embraced every aspect of what God allowed to happen to him in this cursed fallen world, didn't he? Did so humbly and willingly and for the benefit of who? For his own benefit or for someone else's? Whose benefit? Mine and yours. He dies on the cross. He dies passively and victoriously. He loses, but he wins. And he wins what or who? He wins us he shows us what true righteousness is, true submission, accepting the fallenness of this world and all the ups and downs of it, the things we easily deem good and even the things that we would say are not good. Jesus accepts that mix in his life and goes through the worst of trials and the worst of suffering. He's tempted in all ways we are tempted, yet without what? Without sin. I mean, the humility is staggering. He is the only one who can save. I mean, it's amazing. We think of the big things that Job lost in his life, and okay, yeah, it makes sense that that rebellious part would come out when that's the case. And, and we think, well, I don't, you know, I don't see myself doing. But do you realize, like, every little complaint we utter, which happens pretty regularly, and if you don't believe it happens, check in with one of your family members. They can probably give you record of some of those times. But all the things that happen, we, we just, it's like God could ask you, will you, in, will you contend with the Almighty what I've allowed to happen in your life? Even the evil that I have allowed to take place. I mean, think about it. It was, it was the Chaldeans, the Sabine. I mean, Job was victimized by criminals. It wasn't just natural disasters. That's bad enough. But these criminals took all of his stuff too. I mean, it was everything. Moral evil, natural evil, the whole business he is confronted with. Bam, it's all right there and he's leveled. And God, in his providence and in his good plan, allowed that to happen. And the same God allows things to happen in our lives. And again, can we know all the reasons why? No. But we can say a few things. One, he's up to good. First of all, we can we not conclude? Like, hey, he lets us exist. If God eradicated all evil, yes, we were created good. We want to emphasize that at our church because that is part of God's revelation. We are good by design. He's blessed us with many gifts and abilities and opportunities. It's all a good gift. And we're fallen. And there's this mix, and there's evil, and there's perversion, and there's the countless ways that we harm ourselves, others, sin. There's all of that, and God lets us exist, right? So there's that, which is a pretty big deal. And in terms of letting evil around us exist, and even providentially designing the evil that takes place that we are touched by, we can say he uses that to rescue us from the evil within, to reveal to us our utter and desperate need for salvation from him. That at the deepest levels, however mature we might believe we are or righteous we might believe we are, all it takes is the right thing to hit us. And it's probably different for all of us, not just probably. It's different. It would take more or less or one thing or another thing to kind of hit your Achilles heel. But we all are mortal. We all, even as followers of Christ, there's that natural fallen part of us. And all it would take is for God to touch the right button and that same rebellion would come out. And, and the good news here is that God says, in Christ, I am exposing that and I'm covering. Remember, Job said, I clothed myself with my righteousness. And what was it? It was his track record. It was all his works. And God says, look, that's all fig leaves. That's all nothing. I'm giving you superior covering, the covering of Christ. He's your righteousness now. You're in him. You're bound to him. You are declared righteous. End of story. No more track record scorekeeping. That's all human stuff. From God's perspective, it is finished. You're in him. And sometimes it takes suffering and trials for us to appreciate what that even means. 
to see the darkness of our hearts come out and to know that God's response to our evil, to our rebellion, even to our hatred against Him, His response is goodness, kindness, love, forgiveness, covering, mercy. It's truly amazing. The gospel is, is amazing. So we'll close with this with this thought. We talked about this in Sunday schools weeks ago. I was covering for, for Don maybe months ago now. And there's a little part because I was amazed by the things I was seeing in Joel back then. And, and so we asked this question, what do you do or what do you think when God puts you in your place? So even that expression, I mean, like to be put in your place, is that uh, positive or negative? Go ahead. Is it positive or negative? Everyone's still awake out there. I know it's a little warm in here. I mean, initially, I mean, it's just negative, right? And you say, hey, I put so-and-so in their place. Does that mean like, hey, I'd give them some compliments? No, it's not a good, like, or if I was put in my place, I don't like that. God put Job in his place. From dust, Job was created. And he was more thoroughly acquainted with the fact to dust he would return. We are of the same constitution as Job, aren't we? The only difference between Job and us is, is timing. We too will lose everything. The way it tends to go is like drips, little experiences of that. Job, it was a flood. It was all like at one point. And I, I think you're probably with me in voting. Like if it's up to me, I'm voting for the, you know, the deferment plan, the installment plan. Can we just like, and we have no control over that. But the reality is we too are, are just mere mortals. It's creatures. And when God puts us in our place, he acquaints us with that reality. While we hear that as a negative, for us it's the problem of evil, God says that's the place where I show you myself and my heart for you. My commitment to rescuing you in ways you don't even know you need rescuing. That's where I meet you with kindness and grace. So we're invited to accept this complicated world. The ups and downs of it. The things that we easily reckon good. The things that we don't reckon good. The darkest parts of life. We're invited to face and accept and to know that our righteousness is given from another. And as we struggle with the outbursts, whether it's little things, little complaints or frustrations, or the big things, there's been some huge loss, something God gave us, He took away, a loved one or something else that is just flattening. In His way, in His time, we can believe He's up to good. He's revealing Himself. He's rescuing us from that which plagues us the most, namely ourselves, our pride, our autonomy. He's rescuing us at that deepest level, and he loves us, and we're in Christ. And in the end, remember Job, he was blessed again, wasn't he? And he was all his things were restored. He had, well, not the same children, of course, but he had other children, and, and all these things like God gave him, and that too is just a little picture because he ended up losing that at some point too. He's not still around, neither is his stuff. So he lost at some point, but in the end, it's a picture of what we have with his hope. The best is yet to come. The sufferings of this present time, not even worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed to us. The revealing of the sons and the daughters of God and the new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness dwells and all things are restored and all things are whole and all things are complete. And in the meantime, God says, just accept. Accept smallness. Accept mortality. Learn to rest in my provisions for you to delight in my kindness to you, even in exposing evil and covering you. Hope that's encouraging to you. Let's close in prayer. God, thank you for the time we've had this morning considering your truth. And we admit to you, Father, there, there are lots of things that we don't like that you allow to happen in this world in general, in our lives in particular. And if the right thing happens, we, we will... Truly, in our heart, we, we could have rage toward you, Father. And some of us have, and maybe all of us have at some point. 
And we confess that to you, God, and we confess to you along with that we cannot save ourselves. But we thank you for Jesus and what he did and coming in our place and living for us and dying for us and subjecting himself to all the worst forms of human evil and even the other types of difficulties of this life and how he lived sinlessly and victoriously and how he allowed himself to die passively to lose but also to win by winning souls to himself and opening our eyes to your glory and greatness. As we wrestle with this problem of evil, God, help us to see, even with some of the unresolved issues or some of the unanswered questions, help us to, help us to see your goodness revealed most glaringly, most gloriously through the person and work of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.